PCP, hello, at KCP, and uh, received his PhD in physics from Princeton. And today we'll be telling us about experimental and theoretical aspects of uh, tests of gravity on a wide range of scales. Thanks, Eric. So my talk will be in three parts. I'll start out by describing modified gravity and the sorts of dark energy models that you can get from modified gravity. Uh, particularly, particularly a what are called screen fifth forces, that is models that couple to matter and hide their fifth forces locally so that gravity looks like VR or putting in gravity on yeah. scales. But then I will describe uh, tests of gravity at two different scales. First, the laboratory scale, where you can measure these fifth forces directly at the sub millimeter scale and searches for uh, new particles that result from uh, modified gravity and dark energy type models, which call photons. And finally, I'll discuss astrophysical and cosmological tests, uh, both from uh, stars, from the neutron stars to Cepheid variables to the dragon stars, all the way to uh, cosmological scales, fifth forces and the growth of uh, large scale structure. So we know that the two thirds, of, sorry, three fourths of the universe is something that we can't identify. We call it dark energy. Uh, the simplest possible model is just a constant energy density, not to a constant. So this could just be a constant that does absolutely nothing. Uh, there are two different ways in which uh, this dark energy can differ from the simple lambda, simple cosmological constant. You can have a time variation in the energy density of, the, of this uh, vacuum energy, this dark energy. And the simplest model for that is just an equation of state that differs from minus one. The equation of state is the ratio of the pressure to the energy density. Now, if we assume this to be a constant, the data pretty well constrain it to the 5 to 10% level to be minus one. But the game's not over yet. If we allow a time variation, a change in redshift, this is your standard W0, W0 representation, you can have very large changes in the equation of state over between, redshift, between now and redshift one, for example. So you have models where uh, for example, W0 is negative one and a half, WA is one or something. So it's not at all clear that dark energy is just a lambda, although that would be the simplest model. The other class of uh, dark energies are those which don't evolve much in any noticeable way, but couple to matter in ways that can give you fifth forces and new particles. And this, it, it'll be these models on which we focus uh, the rest of the talk. So what if uh, W of C just is minus one? Well, do we give up? Do we say it's just a lambda? It could be in 10 or 20 years that we see no further deviations from minus one. What else do we look for? Well, there are plenty of dynamical models in which the field can sit at the minimum, minimum of potential or slow roll down of potential or just have, live at a really flat potential that's like this. It's at some known zero value. And these will all give the same um, expansion history that you would expect from the simple lambda. So how can these be distinguished? Well, one possible way is to look for couplings to enough particles, to stand for particles. And as a general class, modified gravity models tend to do this. So let me discuss uh, several different modified gravity models and uh, talk about sort of, come up with sort of a theoretical toolbox of things you can expect at the, in a low energy effective dark energy theory when you start out with modified gravity. So we can start by modifying the action. We've got a class of theories called FMR gravity theory where you replace the einstein hilbert action R by some function F R. And um, you put in a coupling of a field to the einstein hilbert action. Uh, general four-dimensional modified action theories give you uh, chameleon-type models, and if you put in a symmetric coupling between the, between the field and the yeah, Ricci scalar, you can get synchron-type models. The new physics that you get out is uh, matter coupling uh, with roughly gravitational strength uh, and an effective mass that depends on the surroundings surrounding density that this field was in. You can look at compact extra dimensions. The simplest model of these is, a, is a, the Kaluza Klein model, which is just um, one single compact extra dimension, whose size is controlled by a scalar field called the radial. So uh, your effective four-dimensional theory looks like a scalar field theory. And usually this radial is taken to have some fixed value at, at some high mass, so that its dynamics don't become clear, uh, don't, 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 don't become apparent in experiments. But, um, this radion can live in some sort of potential. It, you'd expect a matter coupling, and you can also have it uh, include a client or a couple of photons in a more complicated extra dimension theories that can couple all the gated bosons. So generically, you can get matter couplings and photon coupling, gated boson coupling. And lately, there's been a lot of interest in non-compact extra dimensions. The simplest uh, brain world model that realizes this is called BGP. Uh, it's about a thousand years old now. And so we live on this uh, three, 
three spatial dimensional brain in this extra dimension that can warp in, in the extra dimension. And so what we see as an effective theory uh, is this uh, brain that can warp in an extra dimension where this brain bending mode looks like a scalar field. Uh, this is kind of a strange scalar. It doesn't have a potential, but uh, it takes a non-linear, non non-canonical kinetic term. And that also gives you a matter couple. Now, I've highlighted these three theories because, well, in general, you get a matter coupling out of the modified gravity, but the simplest matter couple theories can give you large shift forces that have already been pulled out. So you have to come up with some qualitatively new scheme for hiding these shift forces that are called screening mechanisms. And then, so these give you several different screening mechanisms. There's the chameleon, the synchrotron mechanism, and there's one that comes from this non dependent term. So I'll discuss all of these in turn. So the theoretical toolbox I have to work with here is uh, you have a bunch of theories with matter couplings, possibly photon couplings, and some nonlinear mechanism for high energy forces. Uh, it's just not the couplings, but uh, it's also the mass of the So these, uh, so first, the chameleons, for example, screen themselves by acquiring a large mass. And so you're uh, Galileos have no mass, and so they have another. But I'm playing on with their, with this, like, stabilized, it's very heavy. That's true, you're right, right. So you can just turn up the mass to well above standard model scales and you'll see. So let me start with the chameleon mechanism. This is what I will be talking about the most. Let's take some potential, this is a 1 over 5 potential, for example, which is just a bare chameleon. The effective potential is that plus some coupling to matter, the matter density is rough. So if I put in a very small matter coupling, like you might expect cosmologically, I get a coupling term, which is this green line, the interaction term, and then an effective potential, which is the sum of those two. And so what you see is that the, that the field now acquires a minimum, and the mass, which is the curvature of the potential about that minimum, is something very small at low densities. So you can have a long range scalar mediated for force. Now, if I cranked up that density, you got a higher slope to the interaction term, a change in the value of the, minimum, of the field's minimum, and the curvature of the curvature about that minimum goes up, so the field mass gets really high. Essentially, what's happened is you've taken something that could be a long-range uh, fifth force at cosmological scales or at very low densities, and turned it in the solar system or the laboratory to a very short range fifth force. Now, now, the, this plot assumes just a constant density everywhere. Um, we discuss another type of screening called thin shell screening that we also see in computer theories. So let's start with the equation of motion. Um, let's, uh, let's take the static case. So you get uh, just a, a grass squared from the box. Now, in the non-relativistic non case, and the case where the potential is unimportant, you get uh, something that looks a lot like the sum equation. And sure enough, the field just tracks plus sum equation. Up to additive and multiplicative constants, it just follows the gravitational potential. So, if, so this is a linear regime. The field just uh, linearly responds to the matter density. Now, at some point, as you make the gravitational potential of your object, let's say you had an object at fixed density that you made larger and larger. Its gravitational potential grows. And at some point, you're moving into a regime where the derivative of the potential gets large. And so this V prime term cancels off the source term, which is your density. And so your field, the source of the field essentially turns off as you make this object bigger and bigger. So this transition regime occurs at some potential that's determined by the maximum the field is allowed to move in field space, essentially, which, de which is dependent on the theory. But once you've crossed that transition regime, you're in the, you're in the, you're in the nonlinear uh, regime, uh, where essentially the derivatives go away, and these two terms cancel off against each other perfectly, and the field just approaches some constant. So you can see here's some uh, extremely nonlinear object where uh, this dotted line here is the radius of the object. Uh, outside, the field falls off like the gravitational potential. And inside, the field just hits its, uh, its potential minimizing solution and just sits perfectly there. So let me show you another example of thin shell screening. I've plotted, in this case, the gravitational potential and the chameleon field a little bit differently. I set them both to zero at the origin. And I scaled them so that they're constants. Uh, so I scaled them so that they ought to match in the, in the linear region. So, uh, I've chosen a model for which the screening potential is 0.0014, and right? I'm taking stars that are larger and larger at constant density. Just a rough calculation, a rough, rough example of what the, these are look like. So the colored uh, red line here is the chameleon field, and the dashed line is the gravitational 
Now, if I take a slightly bigger star, you can see the same thing, the Newman field and the gravitational potential are attracting one another. As I go to bigger and bigger stars, however, you'll see the Greenland field kind of slip to fall behind uh, the gravitational potential. And in the very largest stars, the chameleon at the center of the star just doesn't grow at all. It remains fixed to its potential minimizing value. The source is essentially zero until you get out to somewhere near uh, the outer radius of the star, and then the field starts growing. And these are all uh, greater than the screening potential. So it's a fairly sharp transition. Um, Factor a few below this, your chameleon field attracts your gravitational potential. And uh, by even twice this, your, your star is fairly well screened. And your field is only really changing with the outer edge of the star. So at which scale should we probe these models? I'll be discussing laboratory experiments and astrophysical and cosmological probes. So let's take a sort of hand-waving uh, hand approximation that you can rule out order unity fifth forces in the lab on millimeter scales and larger. And cosmologically on the megaparsec scale. And the question is, how do each of these models scale with density? How, how do the, how, how do the characteristic the Compton wavelength on which they fall off with distance? How does that scale with density? The models that scale really rapidly, which mainly come from FOR models, these uh, blue dash and green dash lines, for example, if you, take, uh, if you take their masses to be something that we could barely rule out cosmologically, they get extremely massive by lab scales. Their forces would fall off uh, so quickly that no short range gravity experiment would be able to see this. If you take something like the Phi to the fourth theory, its mass scales a lot more slowly with density, so we'll be able to, to probe something in the lab that is far too small scale to look at from there. So essentially, these two are complementary. You want to look for roughly n between negative one or negative a half and, uh, and one or so for uh, cosmology, and n less than that and n greater than two for a laboratory experiment. Okay, so before I get into the actual experiments, I've, I've uh, thought uh, more recently about what happens when you look at quantum corrections to these models. So I get, correction, uh, get uh, questions when I gave these talks in front of particle physics audiences. Well, what about loop corrections to FMR gravity models, for example? So uh, the one loop correction to the potential of chameleon and FMR models looks something like this. The important part is the scales is mass to the fourth. Essentially, then you're stuck between a rock and a hard place. You want this, this theory to get a really large mass to hide from the force constraints in uh, small-scale gravity experiments, for example. But if you make your mass too big, then your loop corrections get large, and you lose control of the theory. You, can't, it, it, you can no longer make reasonable predictions. So it turns out that the f gravity theories that are accessible to cosmological probes, the ones I showed you on the last slide, have masses that scale really, really rapidly with density. And so that those mass, that their masses get so large that their one-loop corrections are just much larger than their tree level at, uh, at lab scales, which means you can't trust uh, the standard cosmologically probe and more models in the solar system or in the lab. You just don't know what the predictions are. So I asked, well, can we modify FFR? Can we modify the potential in the high-density regime to save these theories, to make, to make them predictive? And, and it turns out that you can, but just barely. So uh, let me show you. Uh, as an approximation, let's neglect the long term, and uh, this, con this constraint then, if I require that your loop corrections to the chameleon field and the background chameleon mass uh, be subdominant to the tree level, I get some, some upper bound on the chameleon mass, which, if I plug in the numbers, turns out to be uh, about 7 milli EV, which is just around the dark energy scale, kind of a numerical coincidence. So this is the, so this is the rock and the hard place here. These blue-shaded models have large quantum corrections. And these red-shaded models are already excluded by the Etwash torsion control experiment. So there's just a thin sliver of allowed, allowed parameter space. Um, FMR models have uh, beta around 0.4, so that you around here. There's a thin sliver of allowed parameter space in which uh, you have uh, loop corrections smaller than the tree level and that are not all of your rule down. And I will show you that uh, the next generation of the Etwash experiment should be able to push into this gap and rule out a lot of these models. So let's start with the second part, the laboratory tests. Now, what is this Edwash experiment? It's uh, a small-scale test of gravity based on a torsion pendulum. So uh, this upper assembly is uh, mounted on a wire, and it has a pattern of holes punched into it here. And on the bottom, you have a disk, a uniformly rotating disk with the exact same pattern of holes. So essentially, as these uh, lower holes rotate in and out of alignment with the ones on the, with the, ones on the pendulum on top, they torque this, uh, this pendulum back and forth. 
And small angle deflections can be detected by laser deflection from the mirror uh, on the spindle. So this is an old version of the Wash apparatus. The current version has a pattern of 42 holes in each disc on the upper and lower discs. And the one that they're building, and by the way, it's just in uh, Seattle a month ago, and checking out there into the new version of their experiments. So they've got a prototype of this build. It looks essentially like a pie cut into 240 slices, and you remove every other slice. So you have these 120 spokes going around the edge. Essentially, you have just a lot more features and a lot of you have changes over smaller angles. So this should be sent more sensitive by a factor of a few, maybe order of magnitude. Now, you can zoom into one of these disks and ask, well, what is the chameleon field in these models? I've solved the uh, field, three-dimensional field equations by numerical relaxation method for one hole in one disk passing by another hole in another disk. And so you can compute the fifth force just by finding the gradient in the field everywhere, integrating it over the object that you want to find. Now, this thing, this sort of calculation takes uh, quite a while. And for the smaller Compton wavelengths, it just gets uh, really difficult to do in three dimensions. So in the meantime, I've come up with an approximation, a one-dimensional plane parallel approximation to forecast this next generation experiment. The idea is that you can solve the field equations exactly in the, one, in the case of one-dimensional planar slabs. And so you can use that one-dimensional planar solution, since Etwash is essentially two planar disks uh, parallel, uh, in parallel. You can use this one-dimensional planar solution to approximate the uh, surface field of Etwash and approximate its constraints. So here's how that does. Um, this dashed blue line is the constraints that I got from my exact three-dimensional uh, relaxation method. Uh, this is a paper I published uh, six, seven years ago with the Anwash group. Uh, the shaded green region is one-dimensional plane parallel approximation, where I can just cover a lot more area because uh, it's an easy thing to evaluate. Now, where do they overlap? Uh, I'm doing pretty well. Uh, approximation is correct to a factor of two level. Uh, looks really good because it's a plot that spans an order of magnitude. So the idea is that you're not quite getting these large quantum, not quite getting these models that have large quantum pressures. So this is that gap that I showed you earlier for this one specific model. Now the next generation of that wash will be able to do a lot better. So this is the 504 theory, which is what I showed you on the last plot. The blue dash line again is the prior constraints. And so you're going to rule out uh, models of large quantum corrections on a range of matter couplings between about 0.1 and 100 or so. Uh, so fMR gravities would be around here. And for a range of other potentials, for example, you can, you can roughly do about the same from uh, matter couplings of 0.1 to a few hundred or so. So the upshot is that uh, fMR gravities, if you want to keep them, their loop correction small to a uh, laboratory scale, these are going to be a lot more constrained in the next year or so. By now, one of the other theories I discussed is the synchrotron mechanism. Uh, basically, it works as follows. So here is your effective potential. Essentially, everything is uh, symmetric under phi goes to negative phi, the C2 symmetry. And so the matter coupling also is a phi squared row rather than a phi row. Now, the idea is that when you have no matter coupling, you have a negative mass squared at the origin, and so you have a double well potential. And even if at a low row, you're going to have essentially the same thing. So uh, look at the dashed green line, for example. Now, at low densities, the field is going to see this 2 well potential. It's going to break its symmetry and pick one of these minima. Let's say it sits out here. Now, if you linearize the equations of motion for this effective potential about that background field, uh, back in the expectation value, you find that the effective matter coupling depends on the background value of the field. So if the field sits at some non-zero value, your effective matter coupling is something non-zero. If you crank up the density and you get this blue line, then your field sits at zero and your effective matter coupling goes to zero. So it's a little bit different from the chameleon in that you have a phase transition that, that, that hides these hit forces and dense elements. Now I can ask again, where do I probe something like this? Uh, essentially, I want to look for models at, I want to look at uh, systems with distances around uh, the inverse mass of the theory of the vacuum. And there's a critical density at which the phase transition occurs, so I'm going to probe that density. And there's some parameter space you can probe in the lab of the solar system, and something else you can probe as water. OK, so if you, it turns out that my one-dimensional plane parallel approximation also works for synchrotrons. You can also solve exactly the one-dimensional uh, field equations. And so you can compute the, the torque that you'd expect in net wash versus the distance, and the constraints that you get from that. And so I just did this to see what sort of constraints I'd be able to get. And it turns out you can get a very, you can 
you have a very interesting set of models where your uh, background mass just happens to be at the dark energy scale. This matter coupling scale, which is kind of like a cutoff of the theory, looks just beyond standard model scales. And your self-coupling lambda is right around unity and lower, so what you can rule out by it. And the third type of screening mechanism I, did, I mentioned earlier is the Weinstein screen, which you get from Galileo. It's a DDP type model. Now, what I've plotted here is uh, the derivative of the gravitational potential, that's the red line, and the Galileo scalar field, that's the dashed blue line, for uh, an object. I took a supermassive black hole. So, the gravitational potential, its derivative just falls off as harder than I get to two everywhere. That's just the gravitational force. So the uh, force on a test particle sitting out here somewhere would just be proportional to that slope. Now the Galileans, uh, the DGP model has a particular uh, extra-dimensional scale that uh, cosmology rules, cosmology requires has to be at uh, 10 gigaparsecs, 20 gigaparsecs, something on that scale. So I've taken 10 here. And now there's an, in there's an intermediate scale that's uh, about a third of the way between this scale and the Schwarzschild radius of the object. So between the, between the scale I'll call R star and the cosmology scale, RC, uh, the scale lamb field essentially looks like a linear scalar field. Its uh, kinetic term looks essentially like a canonical kinetic term. And you get a force that's about a third as strong as gravity, which uh, we would have been able to rule out. But below the screening scale, uh, non-canonical, kin non-linear kinetic terms kick in and reduce the derivative of the field quite sharply. So that as you get into the, the, towards the Schwarzschild radius, your many orders of magnitude below this rate of gravity. Now, people have looked at laboratory experiments and solar system experiments as tests for Galileons. For the simplest Galileons that come from this DGP model I discussed, uh, these are subdominant to cosmological constraints. Essentially, you have this one scale that you have to push out to beyond the horizon scale, and then uh, lab constraints are just much, much weaker than now, there's a, a larger parameter space of Galileans that I haven't thought much about, but uh, other experiments should be able to constrain these binary pulsar solar system tests. Uh, but so far, I have nothing for, based on the lab. Now, let's look at photon couplings. Uh, a few slides on this. Uh, so, before I add photon coupling, we can go back to the equation of motion, which is a time dependent uh, wave equation, essentially. Box 5 is the derivative of potential. Now, let's throw in a linear coupling between the field and the electromagnetic field strain, which is pi s squared coupling. So I get the modified uh, chameleon Maxwell equations that couple the field to uh, the field strain tensor. Now, these are easiest to, the effects are easiest to see when I perturb about some constant background chameleon and uh, magnetic fields. And so I just get plane waves uh, for the photon and the chameleon field. But these two are coupled by a quantity that goes as the uh, chameleon photon coupling, the at the momentum of the wave and the magnetic field. So, you, so what you have are, uh, when you're perturbing about this background, essentially one perturbation corresponds to a chameleon particle. And so if you put a photon through a region of a high magnetic field, you're, it, it can oscillate into a chameleon particle in the same way that uh, a photon could oscillate into an axion, for example. And the oscillation probability in one uh, simple limit goes is the coupling of the field and the length square. So what do you do with these particles once you produce them? Well, it uh, turns out that for chameleons, a window acts as a normal glass window acts as a quantum measurement device. So let's uh, let's take this uh, white region to be a vacuum, and the yellow region is some high density object. Uh, so let's say it's transparent. Then this photon will just pass right through it. The chameleon, on the other hand, its mass as it approaches this dense object will rise, and so you can see these chameleon perturbations dying off as it approaches the wall. Essentially, this is just energy. Function. So its total energy is a combination of its mass and its momentum. As the mass goes up, the momentum goes down until eventually it goes to zero. It reaches some classical turning point, and the chameleon has to bounce off this wall. So if you take this beam that's a superposition of chameleon and photon, that's uh, where some of the photons have oscillated, and try that on a window, photons will pass through, chameleons will bounce, and you've made essentially a quantum measure. So this is the other part of your potential uh, chameleon-photon coupling experiment. Now, if this hadn't been um, a window, if it had been a mirror, just a, a dense object, the photon and the chameleon would both reflect. So you can uh, trap them inside a chamber. And so these two pieces of physics, uh, chameleons reflecting off of walls and chameleons being produced through oscillation, give you an idea, give the idea for just a simple, what we call afterglow experiment. Uh, you can 
imagine a uh, vacuum chamber with a magnetic field inside and glass windows on the entrance and exit. You can stream laser photons through these windows. Most of them will pass right through. And some of them will oscillate into chameleon particles, which will be measured by bounces through the windows. And these chameleons will just be trapped inside this chamber because they're too massive in the walls to escape, to tunnel their way out. So they'll just sit around bouncing inside this chamber. In your second phase, you turn off the laser, you uncover a detector outside one of these windows, and wait for these chameleons to oscillate back into photons, emerge from the chamber, and uh, you should be able to see them minutes, hours later, as a detectable photon afterglow, even after the photons blow away. So at Fermilab a couple years ago, we did just such an experiment. Uh, it's called CHASE, the Chameleon Afterglow Search. Uh, this is, uh, this is a, a schematic diagram of that chamber. Chamber I showed you earlier. This is actually oriented in the opposite way. The laser's over here, and the PMT is off of this end. And we have uh, some interior windows inside to break up uh, destructive interference and to make internal measurements. Uh. And so this is what the signal ought to look like in something like Chase. Uh, you have your, your time on the x axis, your uh, afterglow signal on the y, and the shaded region is our observation period, which is cut off at about uh, 1 hertz. So if one of the lines were to enter this, uh, enter this shaded region, we ought to be able to see it. So you can see that at, uh, at very high magnetic fields, you have a large initial signal that decays away with time because uh, the chameleons are just oscillating back into photons so quickly. As you lower the magnetic field, you get a smaller and smaller signal that falls off also. Now, I've put in a fairly large photon coupling here. So this has been ruled out by Chase. But we would be able to put uh, some sort of constraints on the parameters. So, so we did a thorough study of the physics of chameleons in uh, afterglow type experiments. And this could be its own top on its own, essentially. Yes. So take a, look at this, take a look at this long paper if you're interested. So let me just cut to the chase. Here are the constraints. So in terms of the matter coupling and photon coupling for some power law chameleon theory, you can rule out some chunk of models in this parameter space. Essentially, at the left end, you're limited by a uh, they have to couple strongly enough to matter that they become massive in the walls of this chamber and they get trapped, you can't escape. And this is a big picture of my box so far here. Afterglow experiments, uh, chase, and uh, torsion tendril experiments, constrain lower matter levels. Uh, colliders are up here. So any questions on this stuff? So let me go to the astrophysical test. Well, I guess a basic question. Um, I just have the axiom is what inevitably has a couple of direct magnets. Uh -huh. But why do these hypothetical fields have a couple of necessarily have a couple of direct magnets? Are you just putting in some coupling by hand or so some more basic motivation? There are some models like the Lisa Klein where you'd expect a scale, you could you could just uh, get a scalar field that couples to like a magnet. So I started out with modified gravity as a motivation, and some modified gravity models you can help you do come in with a couple of stuff like that. From string theory, you get dilatons and things that would also have that sort of coupling to photons. So it's something you can write down, but it's not generic. Like f of r doesn't have this, for example. Now, it turns out that if they have a photon coupling, they're easy to look for using something like this. So it's worth doing this sort of experiment. But yeah, it, this won't get at all on my gravity theory. OK, so you can also do a look, look at an afterglow experiment do a sort of an afterglow experiment in which the sun produces your chameleons for you. Uh, you have photons bouncing around inside the sun, uh, KV scale if they're coming from the center. Now the sun has large magnetic fields. There's this layer of the sun that they focused on called the tachycline, which has 10, 20, 30 Tesla magnetic fields. And so these photons bouncing around inside the sun can oscillate into chameleon particles. Uh, people have used this for axions also. And some of these then will head in the direction of the Earth. So you get a reasonably well collimated beam of chameleons coming from the sun. And if you just turn a large magnetic field, take that and point that at the sun, you could get them to oscillate back into photons inside this magnetic field. So CERN has done something like this for axions called CAST, uh, the CERN Axion Solar Telescope. And I would propose that they do this also for chameleons at an energy that, uh, chameleons, ought, that, that chameleons ought to be produced by the sun. And so this is what the solar, uh, solar emission of chameleons looks like. Essentially, you have just very high energy photons from the solar core oscillating into chameleons. And so the spectrum peaks around 600 keV. And so there are forecasts done of uh, what cast ought to be able to see if they put in an X-ray detector book for this. And uh, more recently, I've shown that if you put in an X-ray mirror in front of this, uh, in front of this 
curious girl in front of something like cats, you can increase the collecting area by easily two or three orders of magnitude. Essentially, they can reflect at grazing incidents in the same way that x-rays could. Now, let's jump back to fifth forces for a minute. There was a debate a few years back about whether uh, screening works at all for f of r chameleon type theories in really large relativistic stars, neutron stars, for example. So this is a, this is a paper that made, that made one of these arguments, for example. What they've plotted here is the inverse of the potential. Uh, essentially, this, this potential, uh, when, when you put in some one of the standard functions for f of r, you get this potential with weird singularities. And so what they were worried about in this paper is that at A, you hit a curvature singularity. That is, they reach, as the field approaches A, and they reach a scalar divergence. And so the question was, could you actually reach that in a physical star? Now, in order to find that out, I just integrated the uh, coupled uh, f of r and uh, modified gravity equations for our optimistic star. I just had your metric with um, these two potential terms, n and b, uh, and was hydrostatic equilibrium. I took the simplest possible equation of state, which is what, what their paper also did, uh, just a constant energy density. And the modified Einstein equation in terms of this uh, derivative f sub r, which is uh, dfdr. And in, uh, in other slides, I've talked about uh, the field, which is just a conformal transformation of this, uh, this theory in which uh, you write modified action. And the field just goes like the log of here. So you have your modified gravity equations, you can solve those, and it turns out they work just fine for relativistic size. Uh, here I've scaled the field so that uh, this curvature singularity where we choose, the Vichy scale of divergence happens at phi equals zero. Turns out you can get really, really close to that curvature singularity, you just get very large stars, and you, you can solve the equations just fine. So this is just a strange relativistic effect at the center. Uh, essentially the field couples to rho minus 3p rather than rho. So as the pressure decreases towards the outer edge of the star, the, uh, essentially what the, the, the effective density of the chameleon sees increases, and so the field goes closer towards that uh, hyperrigid regime. But it just matches on perfectly to what's going on in the horizon. And uh, this is a paper I wrote with Wayne Hu a few years back. Uh, so you see the same sort of screening in relativistic and non-relativistic stars as your gravitational potential gets larger and larger, your chameleon field essentially tracks that until you hit some delta phi that's determined by the uh, potential here, and then the field just levels out. And in a relativistic, in a potential that allows, uh, that allows the field to be linear all the way up to relativistic scales, you see the same thing, just levels out. Okay, so stars can exist in modified gravity, so is there any way we can look for these fifth forces anyway? Well, I showed you these plots uh, yeah, slides back where the field rises suddenly towards the outer edge of the star. This dotted line is the outer edge. So there are stars in which the relevant physics, Cepheid variables, for example, where the relevant physics that governs their pulsation happens at the outer edge. And there are stars, uh, red giant branch stars, for example, where uh, luminosity mainly comes from the stellar core. So if you had a Cepheid variable sitting in an environment where, it was on, where its outer edge was on the screen, you would have extra fifth forces, and so you're, essentially your restoring force uh, gets larger, and so your, uh, your period then would go down in a way that depends on the fifth force model, on the uh, fifth force model. Now, this would depend on the location of the Cepheid. So a Cepheid just sitting out there in a vacuum somewhere or in some dwarf galaxy in the middle of nowhere would, would see these really large uh, fifth forces. But you could be screened also by the background that you're sitting in. So a Cepheid sitting in the Milky Way galaxy or in, close enough to it would uh, would be screened depend would be screened based on its location. And so you'd see this uh, breakdown of this period luminosity relation only for Cepheids in sufficiently diffuse uh, environments distant from that. Whereas the uh, giant branch stars are self-screening, so wherever they sit, their core temperature will still be in a screened environment. The physics will be unchanged. And so you can see that uh, if you look at different modified gravity models, you're going to get percent level changes in the luminosity and the forces for RGB stars, and 10, 20, 30 percent changes in semi variables. So people have looked at these stars in different environments. And you can make well, what's called a screening map. You can uh, do an n body simulation and ask, well, what, so what, what sorts of environments would screen these stars enough to see them? So I told you earlier about the screening potential, which governs this transition between uh, the screened and unscreened regimes for the chameleons. If, uh, if 
if the screen potential is fairly large, then most of the global group is on screen, and so your Cepheids are going to see large fit forces, and we want to roll that out later. So they've, they've managed to kill this model, and this is work by Bukinesh Jane and uh, in collaboration with the Portals group. Um, at smaller screen potentials, you have dense, dense regions of screens, so this is white lines show which regions are screened. And as you keep turning that down, you just get smaller and smaller galaxies being screened. It looks like a small fraction of the volume is screened, but that's deceptive because that's also where the stars are. So a large fraction of the Cepheids then are going to be screened. And so people have been looking at Cepheids to uh, calibrate the distance relation globally. And, uh, so they've proposed that they just look at more Cepheids uh, in the local group, but particularly in unscreened environments. And they, they uh, right now they can rule out screening potentials down to about 10 to the minus 6. They hope to be able to improve on that by factor a few, maybe in order of magnitude. Okay, so another type of project I've gotten interested in lately is uh, fifth forces would fifth forces would increase the velocities with which galaxies fall towards uh, large scale structures. <coughs> so the relevant probe here is redshift space distortions. So we already see that uh, so galaxies are already falling into clusters, and so if we treat the redshift coordinate as a position coordinate, then things would look to be more strongly clustered along the line of sight, just because we th see things falling towards us as being a little bit closer to the cluster that they're falling towards. For them. So things like chameleon theories, symmetron theories, would, would give you fifth forces that enhance these velocities. And so you'd get even larger redshift space distortion. So this is um, an example based on a numerical simulation. People have kind of uh, theoretical unsatses for what these velocities ought to do in modified gravity models. What I'd like to do at Argonne is use the computing power that we have to do simulations that would let me predict out to smaller scales what the redshift space distortions ought to look like. And these are being probed by things like BOSS, and what we look for using a, using a more powerful surveys in the future. Now, if we go to even larger scales, uh, this is some work I did several years ago in grad school. Uh, this, is, this is the last model I'm aware of that had large uh, changes in the equation of state over time and large shift forces, and this has been a little doubt. Uh, so this is an interesting example. Essentially, you can so you can tune the parameters to fit the expansion history, and then you can get uh, fifth forces that look very different. So you get uh, growth of structure that looks very different. Now it turns out that there's only one parameter here that tunes the fifth forces and the changes in the equation of state, and so you can pin this model in several different ways. You can choose the this one free parameter to fit the supernovae and the larger L uh, CMB power spectrum, and then it turns out that you get a very strong, anomalously strong ISW effect. Now you can play some, so putting in curvature doesn't really help you there. Uh, you can play some games with the initial power spectrum. Let's say you can do that. You can cut that off at very large scales. But then you can't fit the bump that you do see in the EV modes. So if you allow for all of this, uh, this paper was about five years ago, I ruled out self-accelerated DGP to nearly five sigma, just from a combination of probes. So you can look at uh, large-scale cosmological probes as constraints on chameleon theory. Uh, this is uh, some work done by Wayne Hu and Lisa Wiki and Robin Schmidt. What they saw was that uh, fifth large fifth forces would give you um, a greater number of large clusters. So you can compute, uh, so the equation of state now differs by a few percent or less from minus one. It's not something you'd be able to see looking at the expansion history. But the power spectrum for some of these models differs by order 10 percent or even more. And your cluster counts uh, can differ by quite a bit at the very high mass. And so they use they, they calibrate into their simulations and unsots uh, for what the clusters for uh, their cluster counts and what you ought to see in that gravity. It turns out that uh, they've ruled out some of the screening potentials greater than about 10 to the minus four. So this was several several years ago. This was the best mm -hmm. the, the best result at that time. And um, possibly using better simulations, you might be able to push that down and make that competitive with the Cepheid variables. Okay, so let me wrap up. Uh, essentially, you have uh, modified gravity couplings, which generically predict uh, couplings that lead to fifth forces, which can lead to new particles that can also be produced uh, through oscillation. Now, if you have gravitation strength uh, fifth forces from these models, then they have to be screened locally. And so you need some sort of screening mechanism, uh, typically a nonlinear non screening mechanism that hides these fifth forces locally. But you still have residual fifth forces that you can search for that allow you to distinguish between these types of theories and types of screening mechanisms. 
So laboratory experiments are, uh, particularly modern torsion pendulum experiments, have gotten very good at probing the scale that is characteristic of the dark energy, this about 100 micron scale. And those show a lot of promise for ruling out and some interesting modified graphic models. You can also use stellar physics for testing fifth forces and uh, new particles from the sun, for example. And cosmological tests can exclude very large scale gravitation strength of forces uh, from structure formation. So, uh, thank you. What's the influence on relative step by the emergency of non black holes? So, because of the no hair theorem, I wouldn't expect black holes to have uh, decoupled to these scalars at all. So, I wouldn't expect, uh, so at least for chameleons and synchrotrons, I would not expect any, any new physics from black holes. Now, there was a paper recently looking at uh, Galileons and black holes. They showed that for a binary pulsar, you would radiate away something in the scalar, but it would be six, seven orders of magnitude lower than the, your energy loss due to gravitational waves. So they, they say that you should be able to find a model in some more complicated parameter space where you can say something interesting, but the models I've shown so far, uh, these aren't really constrained. Is, is what you said about black holes obvious? I mean, this is naive. If you think about a black, astrophysical black hole and a frozen star approximation, so, I mean, I, classical things that black holes are, you know, are a good example of why barium never must be violated. You know, you put in barium and out comes the Hawking radiation. But before the Hawking radiation has come out, which classifies with black holes essentially never happens, uh, can't you think of there as being a frozen layer of barium number seen the surface, or does it all be expect that higher energy physics is you know, breaking it down within some, some layer, which is very highly rich and, and, and that's why you, you essentially don't expect a, 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 a coupling to these additional fields. Sure, fair enough. So let's say you had some blob that expanded outside the neutron stream. So uh, neutron stars, for example. The trouble is that these are so dense that screening gets you. Um, so the gravitational potential of a neutron star at the surface is like 0.1 or 0.2. Uh, these things, you, Cosmology already rules out models that uh, that screen things with gravitational potentials larger than 10 to the minus 5 or 60. Right? So stars, so large dense stars are just going to be so screened that chameleons aren't going to see anything. Now, Einstein screening works a little bit differently. So Galileans, there might be some hope for some models. These chameleons are very massive. So they would have an extra degree of freedom. So depending on how they the <coughs> precise choice of models, I mean, you could end up with another relativistic degree of freedom. Uh, would they act as extra dark matter? My hunch is that you wouldn't. You wouldn't have many of these particles around, so the contribution of the energy density would be small. But you put in some numbers, and I'm sure there's some some place in parameter space where you could exclude them based on that. Overclosure, it's right. So it totally depends on the um, initial fluid that would be around. It depends yeah, on so the mass. The energy density is just the mass multiplied by the field value. From, so I guess it totally depends on that. Right. Oh, but in high densities, you're going to be in the spectrum. Yeah, right. So you're not sitting on something. Right, right. Okay. But you do get a mass from that, right? You, mm -hmm. Essentially, your uh, row over this uh, couple of parameter m squared is mass squared. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to get particles of some mass from that, and, and that mass will change with redshift. Mm -hmm. And that could be a way to conserve this thing. I haven't really thought about that much. And then they um, become very light um, as it comes to the present time, right? That's right. So, do those models like give those predictions on how W change the physics of mass? Or does it change the mass of the model? So the, one way I could think of where you would get W change from these models is if you had domain models, for example, that could fall into different minima and different regions of the universe. And so uh, you could have domain models that are produced sometime in the middle of the universe and live till today, and so have some network of and uh, now this can't be, I, I thought about this in the set of models that I've watched in probe where mu is an order of the dark energy scale. And there the domain wall contribution to the energy density, if there are any 
going to be far smaller than that. But I've been talking to uh, Wayne Lu and Justin Corey about what well, can we tune the parameters somewhere so that you get million moles that are a sizable contribution to the uh, energy density. And so we think we might be able to get uh, dark energy coming from a domain mole component from synchrons plus some macro moles. It's going to be What's that? Well, the main moving on. So if they're produced during the end, their velocity is ratio away pretty quickly. So in the late universe, they're going to be too much of this. Normally they follow a number of actions that the tension causes them to move as close as the effect of this and it's going to be like in Colton of course, the main wall of those guys are moving at some relativistic speed. Right. So they're, we're, so they're working at a particular scale. So Colton Turner actually is a so this is where I looked them up, and they claim that uh, after BBN, their their density is their energy density is rich or sorry, their uh, velocity is rich This is what I was wondering: Why don't domain laws just find each other and annihilate? Exactly. Right? right. But as the universe expands, essentially you get one per horizon. Yes. So they do that, and you get one per horizon at the time that they they form, but then they freeze out. And so your sort of the spacing of the network is it's this kibble mechanism: is the horizon size at the time they form, form and end slow down. People they keep going and they maintain all that as obviously it's the scaling proof. And our cosmic swings and the main walls and textures stay at approximately one per point. If there's any tension, so unless you have the you have some screening effect that is it that the tension on the wall goes away. No, so they, well, they, but they stay at one per horizon at the time they're formed, right? So there's some process of formation and slowing down. Right? When the slowing down happens, you just hop over it. And there's some there's, 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 there's some scale at which they can't move by horizon anymore. And at that point, they kind of freeze out. Okay. Oh, fine. I wonder if it's different. But I did have a more technical question. And we didn't mention uh, lensing as a potential probe of anything, even though there have been papers by people talking about them being a probe of something. So these are unrelated, though? No, it's actually really related. So if, if you put in, uh, so chameleon theories, or FMR theories, are conformally coupled, which means the photons just wouldn't see them at all. They wouldn't see the chameleons. So, Particularly if you use something like redshift space distortions in correlation with weak lensing, your photons would probe one potential and your velocities would probe something completely different. So that has the potential to be a powerful probe. Um, I am not aware of any uh, calculations that have been done with this, but uh, yeah, if you know some, I'd love to talk about it. So this is something I've just got interested in. Uh, potential to do some uh, simulations and push this out to scales. So Is there any suggestion of scales in these theories where, um, let's say, a measurement of W or W prime is, is accurate enough that we can have as much information as we could sensibly get to to, uh, to to know more about which specific three models are on that? So the trouble is that chameleons basically all predict W equals minus one. Like uh -huh. if you want the galaxy to be screened, then the field and Planck units has to can't change. The galaxy can't make the field roll by more than 10 to the minus 6 or so. So right. the field has to be really, really still in its potential in the late universe, essentially. So W is going to be minus 1 in all f mark theories that are currently allowed. Now, there, there are models like the synchron where you can have a component from domain walls and a component from some other constant. But I can always tune the amount that comes from the contribution from domain walls to be arbitrarily small. So, I, I can't give you a model and say, well, if you get W is minus 1 to within 10%, you've killed this model. Now, if W is not minus 1 and you show that, you have killed a lot of these models. But if, if we continue to see what looks like a lambda, then most of the, all of these are in the mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Well, if no further questions, I think uh, all, and we'll go upstairs for cookies. And um, we'll also go for dinner this evening, probably around.